Of course, I finally have one of my favorite flights of the year, and it just happens to be on an airline that's set to go out of service next year. Welcome to New Delhi Airport, where my day starts at the Holiday Inn, located directly in the check-in area of the New Delhi Airport, as we hop on board Vistara, the Indian carrier, on business class in their 787 in the nine-hour flight up to Paris, Charles de Gaulle. Vistara actually launched service about eight years ago in 2015, and since then has rose to become the second largest carrier on the subcontinent of India, just after Air India. As Vistara has launched a pretty large international market and a sizable domestic market as well. However, as of this year, they have finalized a merger with Tata and Singapore Airlines as they will merge into the Air India brand for the foreseeable future starting in what seems to be March of next year. So we'll see just how that seems to change their product. Now obviously Vistar has had mixed reviews as most young airlines do, as obviously especially in the earlier years they have to work out some of those kinks. We're here to see just how it works out, however I personally think that Vistar operates more like one of the boutique airlines in the United States, similar to JetBlue, and maybe it's just because of their size that they're able to implement some of these newer methodologies to make the customer experience a little bit better, but you can see for yourself once we get on board. At the far end of the terminal, in the A wing, we find the Vistara specific check-in counters. One thing that I do like is that Vistara still completely has their own brand at Delhi Airport, something that isn't always said about airlines going into an upcoming merger. Business class and premium economy had absolutely no line, and economy class even had a very minimal line for Vistara. Interestingly enough though, the international check-in was right next to the domestic departures, meaning that we had to go all the way to the other side of the terminal to get to the international departures, which for me at least is not a big deal since I always like getting some extra steps in before getting on board one of these long flights. Something that was a fun little touch is that the boarding passes all came in these fun little sleeves, which is something you just don't see as much anymore. There was a specific line for outbound immigration and security for business class passengers, however it wasn't marked very well, so I did actually have to ask for directions on how to get there. Once I did get there, the only drawback is because there was only one lane, it actually did take a little bit longer than usual, about 10 to 15 minutes to get through immigration and security before getting out into the terminal where we passed through the obligatory duty free store and then out into the main part of the terminal here in Delhi Airport. Delhi's Terminal 3 is absolutely massive, not only being their largest terminal, but one of the world's largest, opening in 2010 and now handling about 40 million passengers annually with a ton of things to do. Our first stop, however, is upstairs just immediately outside the duty-free store so we can head to the lounge for business class passengers. On the way up there, we did get a great view out the ramp from these escalators to see all of the larger international flights departing. Vistara actually does not have their own lounge here at the Delhi airport, however due to their partnerships with Air India, they do have access to the Air India lounge, so if you're business class on Vistara, you have access to the Air India business class lounge, which I was excited to see considering that this is Air India's number one hub here in India. For a flagship lounge, the Air India lounge here in New Delhi's airport was a little bit below my standards just because it was a little bit basic in my opinion. It did have everything you could need in a lounge, having plenty of seating, having plenty of charging ports, a ton of food options, and it even had showers and a place for kids to hang out. So that was wonderful. It's just not the most grandest of spaces, but if you're just looking for a nice place to relax before getting on board a flight, it is a great place for that. However, personally being a huge fan of Indian food, I was excited to check that out, where first I was greeted with both the veg and non-veg sandwich options, just next to some cookies and assorted snacks. Next to that we found some pastries, something like muffins, croissants, and danishes. Next to that was some of the best melon I've ever had in my life, and around the corner was more of the hot options, like an assortment of chutneys and some bar. Next to that was where they had a steaming pot for the steamed idli. Next to that was where they had the cereal bar along with some cold milk to go with that. Of course also included some bread to toast and immediately adjacent was some veg and non-veg puff pastries. Following that counter was some more hot options including a peanut onion poha, there was a roasted thyme potato, 
and then some more Western options including baked beans, an omelet, and some sausages as well. The last counter included the drinks. First off was a fridge with all of the sodas, juices, and soft drinks. Then was the counter with the coffee machine, and next to that was the assortment of creams, sugars, and teas as well. I decided to go with some more of the Indian options, including of course some of that wonderful melon and a glass of coffee since my day was starting very early for this flight. If you know me, you know I love the airline's branding, so I loved that not only the cups but the sugar packets had the Air India branding, but in addition to that, of course, the silverware also had a printed on logo. I decided to take the scenic route out of the lounge, which is where I saw a couple extra features that I didn't see on my way in, including the shower suites that can be booked at the front desk. In addition, that hallway had these wonderful decorations that followed along the right side of it that I found beautiful. Also along that hallway is where I found nap rooms that can also be booked at the front desk. Currently, they were pretty much all taken, but if you have an overnight connection, it's a nice place to just relax. As I usually do whenever I'm at a new airport, I decided I would leave the lounge early to go ahead and get some shopping done, and also to see different airplanes in different parts of the terminal that I haven't seen before in my life. There is a ton of shops scattered around this main entrance atrium, however the one shop that I was here for, as always, is my TWG tea where I've been trying to hunt down their vanilla bourbon tea forever. And still, at this location and last time I was in Singapore as well, they were completely out of the one tea that I wanted. I also always have an appreciation for the details, and you can see all around the border here of Delhi's airport is this wonderful pattern where they show that they really paid attention to each space in this new terminal. Now I mentioned that I stayed at the Holiday Inn the night before, which is located directly within the airport. They actually have two parts of that hotel, one that's inside immigration and one that's outside immigration. Right here is one that's inside immigration, so if you have a connection but you want to stay at a true hotel, you can book this Holiday Inn just like you would any other hotel, go through the transfer desks on arrival, and then head into the hotel. However, if you do not have a connection, you can just go to the hotel like you would in any other check-in desk, and they'll take you up to the hotel. Because that's how I did it when I was time for my flight this morning, all I had to do was head downstairs to the check-in desks and check in for my flight. Also walking around the terminal, I saw a couple things, including this Vistara 787. Not mine, this one was actually heading out to Frankfurt. I also saw some decommissioned Jet Airways aircraft in the background, which brought back some fond memories for me. Not only is Jet Airways finally coming back into service, however, here's a video that I took about 10 or so years ago of a Jet Airways 777 departing SFO on the one time that I was very fortunate to have an airside ops tour and I got a great video of this 777 taking off. I'm actually going to mute the music for a second just so we can enjoy those beautiful GE 90s from this close in proximity. Now that I'm done being excited about Jet Airways, there was also a smoking room which sold cigarettes right outside. Talk about a professional marketing opportunity. There was also two different yoga rooms that I saw throughout the airport as well. In addition, these duty-free stores on wheels which just look like little airplanes that taxi around with all the duty-free items like alcohol and cigarettes. At the end of this wing here at Delhi's Terminal 3, I had not only a view of a large number of aircraft, including one of them happening to be going back to my hometown of San Francisco, but also what appears to be maybe a past Air India headquarters or maybe an old maintenance headquarters. However, in addition to that, I also had a great view of arriving aircraft on one of the main runways.
Since I was on the complete other side of the terminal for my flight, I eventually had to make my way back towards my gate where I saw a couple things, including the entrance to Terminal 3. Also, possibly the most Indian thing ever was just this parking lot full of all these little motorbikes. But on my way there, I also came across a couple more art pieces. For example, this large statue of Surya the Resplendent One. Eventually, however, about halfway down the other side of Terminal 3, we reached Gate 19, which is going to be home to our flight today, departing out to Paris. From here, we had a great view of our aircraft, which was only a three-year-old 787 Dreamliner, which will soon become part of Air India's fleet after the merger. Actually, just past our gate as well was some of the views of the borders of New Delhi City, bordering right up against the airport itself. Now for the customer side, the Vistara brand might be alive and thriving, however from the operations side, we see a lot of Air India integration as Air India seems to share a lot of the space and we seem to be sharing a lot of their baggage carts. Now it was time to board our flight to Paris and Vistara boards in a similar way to most airlines with one key difference. They do board in a tiered system, so business class first, and then premium economy, and then economy. However, they board economy passengers from the back to front. Sounds maybe a little bit backwards, however, if you think about it, then if the people in the back have boarded first, you don't have to wait for people to sit down to fight past them. Instead, it fills from the back up, and there's less people trying to cram things in overhead bins while lines congregate behind them to get on board the aircraft. Finally though, it was time to step on board one of the most impressive cabin layouts on any 787-9 in the skies today, starting with a personal escort to my seat. Not always a given for business class passengers, but with that I welcome you to the business class cabin on Vistara's 787-9. As far as the setup goes, it's in a 1-2-1 configuration. If you're on a window seat, you're going to want one of the even numbered seats which are a little bit closer to the window. If you're traveling with someone and you want to sit in the middle, you might want one of the odd numbered seats since they're a little bit closer together, although the partition still separates the seats a fair amount. I'll be in seat 4A today. You can see all seats labeled on the exterior of that seat shell. Now as far as the seat design itself goes, it's actually the same design that you'll find on some Singapore Airlines flights, like their 787-10s, but in my opinion, the purple lighting on the Vistara aircraft just makes it look a little bit better. They had all of the cabin shades dimmed for boarding, even though it was the middle of daytime, presumably just to keep it cool, maybe also to show off the mood lighting. However, I did finally raise the dimming and wanted to take a look around what this seat had. First things first, the inside of the seat shell is this wonderful soft and cushiony material that surrounds the entire seat. They also have an assortment of lights here, one for bed mode, one for pointing towards the tray table, and one that points a little bit further out. So depending on what seat mode you're in and what you're trying to do, there is a light for you. The only drawback I'd say about this seat is because that partition sticks out, it blocks one of the two windows to set the seat. Here you can see in the odd numbered rows, it's still blocked a little bit by the counter, but you do have a little bit more of that window exposed when it's not blocked by the partition. In front of you, you've also got the seat back TV, which also can tilt, so if you are in bed mode, it can angle down towards you. The tray table pulls out of the seat back in front of you, just underneath your TV, and it might not be the biggest tray table in the world, but it does have this nice finishing on it, so it does look pretty nice. Below that is where you find the footwell for this seat, and it might not be the biggest in the world, but especially for a daytime flight, it's plenty to relax. And then underneath that, you have some more underseat storage, perfect for storing like a backpack, for example, if you have that with you in your seat. On the seat back in front of you adjacent to the TV is where you're going to find a coat hook and just below that is where you're going to find the literature pocket, which included a magazine as well as just your normal safety card. Now first off was a Vistara magazine. This month seemed to feature a lot about food, local Indian cuisines, as well as some cuisines in some of the different places that they fly to. 
However, one of my favorite things about these in-flight magazines is being able to get to the back where they talk a little more about the airline. They have pages, of course, about the fleet. They have stuff about streaming on board. They have an entire route map where you can see all the different places they fly in and outside of Asia. And in addition to that, you see all their code share partners, both airlines and non-airlines as well. To your right side is where you're going to find the counter. The counter is actually a fairly good size and it gave a good place to get some work done, especially while I was eating. It also came stocked with a water bottle and the amenity kit that we'll get into later. Above the counter is where we find the hook for the headphones that was kept in this cabinet. The cabinet was nice as it had your main charging port so you could put things in there and then close it in there so if you needed to keep the phone charged or whatever and keep it out of sight and out of mind while you're on board, it was a good place for that. In addition, there's also this little tab here that pulls out a mirror at each seat. The seat controls are located on the side of the counter as well, and they remind me more of Air Senegal's in the fact that they're not exactly buttons, and more so just a touchscreen. And located directly behind the seat controls is the plug for the headphones. Below all that is where we find the Seatback TV remote for the in-flight entertainment screen. It's similar to Qatar Airways remote in the sense that it's basically this big screen, it's lightweight, and it operates as a second TV of sorts, so that if you do want to watch a second program or maybe have the map up, this remote can do that for you. The armrest here is adjustable with this button here, although it did take me forever to finally be able to get that button in. It just seemed to be a little bit jammed at first when I got in my seat. But as always, you know I have to show some love whenever they put the individual air vents at each seat. Each passenger also received one of these scented towels before they got the pre-departure beverages from the crew. They then came by with pre-departure beverage choices. I ended up going with this berry type smoothie thing that I couldn't tell you exactly what it was, but it was delicious. And in addition to that, we also had the water bottles that came stocked at every seat. I also pulled the headphones out of the cubby above the console, and in there they came with this nice little Vistara bag, and they were a very comfortable, noise-canceling, over-ear style of headphone. And then we were given the slippers to go with our amenity kit, which is probably one of the best ones I've ever received. The slippers were comfortable, and the stuff that came in the amenity kit was fairly basic. However, the amenities themselves were great quality, and they smelled fantastic. So they were great to use both in flight and after the flight as well, in addition to the wonderful feel of this silk eye mask when we were sleeping. We were also given a pillow and a blanket at each seat. The blanket was somewhat thin, but definitely warm, and the pillow was substantial and very comfortable. Then we were handed the menu for the flight, which included first off the insert for the beverages. One side had the mixed drinks and cocktails, the other side had mostly the wines and champagnes that were available on board this flight. And then there was the main card with the food, I'm always excited to have some good Indian food on board any flight, especially business class. The lavatory on this aircraft was basic and looked like pretty much every 787 lavatory that has ever existed. One thing that I have noticed about a lot of these Asian carriers is that they prep the toilet seat cover for each passenger. It just makes me a little uncomfortable, I don't know. But then we also got these amenities that came in there as well. Back in my seat though, it was time to put the slippers on before taking a look through the in-flight entertainment options on board this Vistara aircraft. And I must say, I think Vistara may possibly have one of my favorite in-flight entertainment systems that I've flown with to date, just based on the options and categories that they have. First things first here, scrolling through the movies. You can see just how many categories they actually have available here, and in each of those categories you can continue to swipe through, and it makes it pretty easy to see everything that they have, but there just seems to be a million options for every type of traveler. TV shows were more of the same, as you can see a ton of categories with a ton of items in each category, and most of these shows had full seasons. Perhaps what surprised me most is just how many English options there were, considering the only English-speaking destination that they fly to is London, not even anything in the United States, and they have plenty of Hollywood options. 
One of my favorite things, however, though, as always, is that you can add shows to your favorites to find it later on. As a large selection of movies and TV shows is almost useless if you have to sort through it every time just to find the items that you want. In addition to that, they also had a large selection of music in a number of genres. Once again, I was surprised to see country music on board, considering they don't even fly to the United States. Then was the games. In all honesty, I usually don't play the games, but it seemed like they had a good selection of different types of games as well. I was also surprised at the amount of live TV options they have, as live TV has kind of gone away on seatback screens. I do remember about 10 years ago when seatback TVs were first introduced, live TV was just kind of the main thing. Lastly is the My Flight. Largely what you're going to find here is the map feature where you can find different stats about your flight and also track where you are on the flight. Personally, I just love when you're able to actually adjust the map, like on this case you see you can zoom in, you can rotate the map, you can pretty much make it your own. In addition, there's a ton of different types of views that you can get, although unfortunately currently a couple of them were unavailable. It was also kind of fun that they had an area just for kids where they had, amongst other things, a kids map, which was a slightly different map but also seemed to have dinosaurs everywhere, including displaying our airplane as a dinosaur. They also had an in-flight Wi-Fi offering that I did connect to once we got in the air. It took you to a main portal where you could access some things about your flight, and then they had their Wi-Fi packages just after that. The Wi-Fi offerings just came at different strengths for the full flight, starting off with chat at the equivalent of about 5 US dollars, all the way up to streaming for about 33 US dollars. As we taxi back here, just a moment to talk about the fate of Vistara. Now, I haven't been able to find out too much hard details about it, except that the merger between Vistara and Air India will likely be completed sometime early next year. Now unfortunately, to me that sounds like the Vistara brand may be going away, which is unfortunate. Because even just on first impressions here, the crew is amazing, the airport staff was great, and the seat and the cabin environment is wonderful, not to mention the incredible in-flight entertainment system. It sounded like they did have plans to launch flights to the United States in the not so far future until this merger was announced and now it sounds like those plans have been suspended, which is unfortunate. I haven't flown Air India's business class, but it's hard to imagine that it compares to what I have today on Vistara. For now though, I guess I'll just enjoy the time that I have on Vistara and hope that when they do merge with Air India that they'll make one great airline that can make India proud.
Once we got in the air though, it was time to go ahead and get comfortable in the seat. The buttons work similar to Air Senegal if you watch that video where it's a touch screen and you just hold that button down in order to get the seat to recline to that. When you let go, the seat stops moving so you can get it in an in-between setting as well. Also, since I saved everything to favorites that I wanted to watch, it was really easy to go find the things that I wanted once I was already in flight to save some time, like this movie that I've been wanting to watch ever since it basically set the record for Academy Awards. It was also made easier because they do have a picture-in-picture -picture mode, so while you are looking through things, you can keep your movie playing in the bottom corner, or you can have a map or progress tracker showing in the bottom corner as well. As our initial routing took us south through India, over towards the Arabian Sea and the northern parts of the Indian Ocean, they were starting to prepare our first of our meal services for this flight. Along with a bowl of nuts, I decided to go with one of their signature cocktails. I decided to choose the Whiskey Sour, it was an eggless version and included passion fruit and orange juice flavors as well. Now I'm not actually a vegetarian, but whenever I go to India, I always am a sucker for the vegetarian options. So with the Vistara branded placemat being put on my tray table, it was no shocker that I was going to go with the Angier Pensada main course, which is the cottage cheese parcels stuffed with figs, also with some tomato gravy and a ranberry pilaf rice, also with a basil infused curried exotic vegetables and creamy yellow lentils to go along with that. There was also a wonderful garlic naan along with some of the Indian mixed pickles which once upon a time I made the mistake of eating all by themselves. We were also given this wonderful parcel of Vistara branded silverware. It was nice to see it tucked away with this little ribbon and upon unwrapping it we could see each individual piece branded with the Vistara logo as well. The dessert that I ordered was known as a dry fruit mawa roll, which was served with condensed milk and flavored with basil seeds. Along with that, I also decided to get a cup of Starbucks coffee. I was kind of interested to see that Starbucks was their branding of coffee considering it's an American-based company, but I did enjoy the mugs having the Starbucks logo on them as well. I also realized shortly after the meal, when I went to use the lavatory, that the front lavatories are definitely not the ones you want to visit. If you have to use the lavatory in the business class cabin, you're going to want to go to the aft lavatories because these are the lavatories that are a little bit lighter. The reason being, they have their own little window inside, as Josh Cahill likes to say, the loo with the view. Then it was time to check out some of the seat modes. Obviously it starts off here in the full seating position here with the pillow making it plenty comfortable. From there though we can use the buttons to take it down into the relaxed position. The relaxed position does tip you back a little bit, however in order to get fully relaxed I usually was somewhere in between this and the full bed mode. Speaking of which, now we will take it fully flat into that full bed mode just so we can see how this bed looks. You can see that it is a fairly wide space here that you have, especially with that armrest drop down. The footwell is a little bit more narrow, however once we were laid down, if you sleep on your back you did have plenty of space. With that pillow and blanket that came with the seat, there was plenty to keep you warm. And if you do get too warm, you do have those individual overhead air vents not always given on these airplanes and so for sleep I was super grateful for that, even though this was a daytime flight and I opted to stay awake for the entirety of this flight. Now for that narrow footwell, as you see, if you're on your back here, you actually have plenty of space for your feet. The problem only comes in if you sleep on your side. If you do sleep on your side, you're going to find your feet a little bit more wedged into that foot cavity, making it a little less comfortable for you to sleep. So if you do sleep on your back, or maybe even on your front, you'll probably be okay in this seat at least. Regardless, if you are wanting to watch some TV while you sleep, you can tilt that TV down and it gives you a better angle at that. In addition, you can turn on your Do Not Disturb light, so if you are looking to get some sleep, it turns this light on outside your suite and the flight attendants won't bother you.
As I mentioned earlier, I actually decided not to sleep on this flight, partially because it was a fully daytime flight, and partially because they had some of my all-time favorite TV and movie options on the in-flight TV screen, and I wanted to make sure that I could watch as much of that as I could. I did, however, seem to fall victim to the curse of picking the wrong side of the airplane to sit on, at least for the majority of the flight here, as we flew by some capital cities in the Middle East that I've always wanted to see, and I would have had a great chance to see them from the air, however, on the right side of the airplane, the only view that I could get was from the galley window, which was kept mostly dimmed. So you can see a very tainted view here of Tehran from 40,000 feet. About halfway through the flight, they came through offering some follow-up drink options for those passengers who were awake. I opted to go with a nice green tea to get me through the rest of the flight and the rest of the day as well. And as we made our way through some smaller mountains, they came by offering possibly my favorite and most unique mid-flight snack. Now if you're thinking about what goes best with a mid-flight movie, it's probably popcorn. And that's exactly what they came through with. These somewhat large cups of popcorn to eat while you got work done or sat back and watched whatever movie you chose to watch on your TV. It was a nice little salty, crunchy snack, something that I've never even thought of having on an airplane. But it was a wonderful little touch here by Vistara. The view out of the left side of the airplane was fairly flat for most of the flight, which is why I was very grateful when we got to the western part of Azerbaijan and later on into Turkey, and we finally had a little bit more scenery to see out that left side of the airplane. As we finally crossed the Black Sea, entering Europe basically on the border of Bulgaria and Romania, prep had finally begun for our last meal service for this flight, starting off with a basic hot scented towel to get us started for the meal service. With the Vistara branded placemat being put once more on my tray table, I was excited to try the non-veg option for this meal, considering I had tried the vegetarian option for my last meal, and it was pretty much just as good. For this one, I got these succulent chicken skewers that were served alongside a cumin and beetroot patty, which also came with a spiced chickpea pocket and puff pastry. Alongside that was also a wild berry cake that was absolutely fantastic, and that all came alongside the starter of a vegetarian Caesar salad. A slightly smaller meal than the first one, but considering it's only about an 8-9 to nine hour flight to Paris, I didn't need anything too grand. To wash this all down with, I decided to go with a glass of Coke, wonderfully refreshing in the Vistara branded glass as well. I was also getting excited as, for the first time this flight, Budapest, the first capital city on the left side of the airplane, was finally coming up. However, as soon as we reached the city of Budapest, it was nowhere to be seen below an endless layer of clouds. Oh well, at least. At least I had a good view out my wing as we made our way across Central Europe. I then decided to play a game, which was to see just how long it would take to cross one of the world's smallest countries. Using my Flight Radar 24 app, as we approached Luxembourg here, I was timing once we hit the border, filmed out the window just to see how long it would take until we reached the other side of the border. And the verdict was 3 minutes and 42 seconds. That's how long it takes roughly to cross one of the smallest countries in the world. 
Not long after that, though, they had finally started making their preparations for arrival into Paris' Charles de Gaulle. As the clouds started to slowly clear, I was excited as I was going to be on the left side of the airplane, which was going to have a far better view of the city of Paris upon our arrival. And with that, we had arrived in Paris to a fully pegged windsock. Slightly surprising, since the current weather products were showing the wind was only sitting at about 10 knots. The other wonderful thing about my side of the airplane here as we taxied into Paris Charles de Gaulle was getting a view of one of Air France's Concords put here on static display for the rest of time, and it was one of the few times that I've ever actually been able to see this supersonic jet in person. As I taxied in, I wanted to take a moment to talk about my final thoughts on Vistara, which is officially the third Indian airline that I've had the chance to fly on. I've flown on Indigo, the low-cost airline. I've flown on Air India, in economy, which is currently the flag-carrying airline of India, and now on Vistara, in business class. Now, I will know that this is the first Indian airline that I've flown in business class, so it isn't exactly a perfect head-to-head -head comparison. However, what I will say from at least seeing the other business classes having walked through the cabins of them, Vistara's business class seems to be light years ahead in terms of its quality. Not only of the cabin feel and the seat quality, but the flight attendants were absolutely fantastic and each introduced themselves by name to me prior to departure. The in-flight product was amazing. Not only was the seatback TV entertainment just about everything that I could have asked for, with a large number of my favorite TV shows and movies, surprising since they never flew to America, but also the food was some of the best I've had on an airplane. I am a sucker for some good Indian food, both vegetarian and non-vegetarian, and both of those dishes were fantastic. I was able to actually get this ticket for a pretty good deal at just over $1,000, which I had saved up in order to try out this business class product, mostly since it might be going away in the near future, which is the last thing that I want to mention, which is the fate of Vistara Airlines. Now obviously we mentioned at the beginning of the video the merger with Tata and Singapore Airlines taking over a controlling share of Vistara and Air India. This means that likely there will be a merger signaling the end of Vistara. 
it shows at the moment that the merger will probably be finalized by March 2024, which means that most likely after that date, the planes will start to become all one airline, most likely Air India. Now I am excited to try out Air India's business class product as I've only had the chance to try out their economy product. However, just having seen it as I walked past it, it would be hard to imagine a business class that can rival the quality of Vistara Airlines. So I am hoping that a merger will actually bring kind of a 50-50 of the product as obviously Air India has a lot of the culture and the history that an Indian flag carrying airline would want to have. But as far as the onboard experience and the customer viewpoint of the airline, Vistara has a wonderful thing going for it, at least in the business class cabin as that's all I can speak to at this moment. I am a little bit bummed considering that Vistara sounds like it had plans to start service to the United States including my home airport of San Francisco and I would have loved to enjoy a longer flight on Vistara Airlines possibly from San Francisco all the way out to India. However, since the plans of the merger have come about, it sounds like the plans for that United States service has been thrown out the window making it so that Air India will likely hold the US service, and Vistara is gonna maintain with its current route network, not expanding to any new destinations until there's more details about the merger. So now, we shift our focus from talking about Vistara Airlines to talking about Paris Charles de Gaulle Airport. Now, with all of my travels, it somewhat surprises me that this is actually my first time at Paris Charles de Gaulle Airport, considering it's a cornerstone of a lot of connections through Europe to get to other places. But, that being said, I've heard very mixed opinions on this airport. A lot of people know about the infamous wait times at immigration. In addition to that, the infamous spread of the terminals being really difficult to get between. And if you have connections between different airlines, even if they are alliance partners, it's really tough to make some of those depending on what gate you end up being stationed at. I actually didn't have a connection, however I did want to avoid waiting in line at immigration forever. So since I was business class, I decided to hurry up the airplane as quickly as I possibly could just to get down the escalator and meet the train, which was kind of an equalizer. Waiting for the train meant that most other people on not only my flight, but a Korean Air 747 also were waiting for the same train, so being at the front of the cabin really didn't save me any time as far as what time I actually reached immigration, which meant that by the time I got off the train at the immigration hub, it was time to pick up my walk into more of a light jog to try and get some priority. What I found when I reached immigration was what looked to be a fairly short line, so I was thinking, sweet, I ended up skipping a lot of the passengers here. However, it turned out that line seemed to be a little bit of a ruse, as it turned out they only had one or two stands open that were currently accepting people through their lines, and so it moved at one of the slowest paces I have ever seen a line move at. They did have lines specifically for US, Canadian, and Mexican citizens, however, for whatever reason, they were closed and not accepting anyone at this time. You can see my watch here, time currently about 9.30. We landed just before 7.30, meaning that it was about a two hour process to get off the airplane and through immigration, and I still haven't even gotten to my bag at baggage claim. One of my favorite things is seeing all the bags here that are just sitting. My assumption is that it was waiting for all the people that were stuck at immigration. However, my flight's bag still hadn't started coming out, so I had to be a little bit more patient waiting for my bag. After waiting for about 30 more minutes, I finally had my bag and I was able to head towards the exit and up to the hotel, which was actually directly here at the airport. And as we leave Paris Charles de Gaulle Airport, we make our way over to the Sheraton Hotel based right here in Terminal 2, meaning that it was actually a very short and easy walk to get there. But with that, the video ends here and I leave you guys with my final question. 
What are your guys' thoughts on the Paris Charles de Gaulle Airport? And what are your guys' thoughts on Vistara and the business class product they offer? And how do you feel about the upcoming merger between Vistara and Air India? Between now and the next time, safe travels, and I'll see y'all next time.